We want to solve this problem by the uh, superposition approach. So first, we break the problem up into two parts. We solve the homogeneous differential equation first. So the corresponding auxiliary equation is 1 over 4 m squared plus m plus 1 equals to 0. If we could factor this, let's see. So we have 1 half m plus 1 half m equals to m for that middle term for m and everything else works out. So this implies that m is equal to negative 2 and m is equal to negative 2. Okay, so y sub c is equal to uh, c sub 1 times e to the negative 2x plus c sub 2 times x times e to the negative 2x. So then the second part is we want to solve the non-homogeneous differential equation by using this so-called superposition approach. So, so step number two we solve 1 over 4 y double prime plus y prime plus y is equal to x squared minus 2x. So here we, bless you, we look at g of x. which is this x squared minus 2x. So what do you think the assumption for uh, the form for y sub p should be? Hmm? No. Here we assume y sub p is of the form g of x is quadratic. So y sub p should be of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay. So that is y sub p is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. You take its derivative, y prime is 2ax plus b, and you take its derivative, y double prime. Why? Because in the original problem, we have y double prime, we have y prime, and we have y. So y double prime is 2a. So we make the substitutions for y double prime as 2a, y prime is 2ax plus b, and then y is ax squared plus bx plus c. So we say that this implies then that 1 fourth times y double prime, which is 2a plus y prime, so that's 2ax plus b plus y, y is ax squared plus bx plus c, and this is equal to the x squared minus 2x. So we simplify what we have. So we have here 1 half a plus 2ax plus b 
plus ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to x squared minus 2x. Now I'm going to group here um, to try to make the left side look like uh, the right side. So, so basically I'm going to write the left side in descending order in terms of their powers. So uh, the ax squares first plus, now I want to get the x's. This is 2ax plus bx. I think those are the only two. So parentheses 2a plus b times x. So now I have left the constants, 1 half a plus b plus c. So plus 1 half a plus b plus c. This is equal to x squared minus 2x. Now if you want to blow it up so you can see how we're going to make the, uh, the transition, this is a 1 here, and this is plus a 0. So a is going to equal to 1. 2a plus b is going to equal to negative 2. You see how we're doing that? If we have an equation, the left side equal to the right side, that means that the corresponding parts of, of an equation must also be equal. Right? And so then the, the next part here, the constants, they're set to equal to 0. Is everybody with me on that? Okay. So, so we say that this implies that a is equal to 1, comma, 2a plus b is equal to negative 2, and then 1 half a plus b plus c is equal to 0. Well, the a equal to 1 is already solved for us. If you take a equal to 1, you can solve for b for that next expression. So this is 2 times 1 plus b is equal to negative 2. So we get 2 plus b is equal to negative 2, so b is equal to negative 4. So a is equal to 1. We take a equal 1 and b equal to negative 4, and we can solve for c for that, that last equation over there. So we have 1 half times 1 plus a negative 4 plus c is equal to 0. So we have 1 half minus 4 plus c equal to 0. We get negative 7 halves plus c equal to 0. And so c is equal to 7 over 2. So, so we have just y sub p is equal to, we said ax squared plus bx plus c. Remember this method for the superposition approach said that uh, uh, it is in reference to undetermined coefficients. What are the undetermined coefficients? The a, the capital A, the capital B, the capital C. So they're undetermined for us to determine them. So y sub p is equal to the a, which is 1 times x squared plus bx, but b is negative 4, so this is negative 4 x plus c plus 7 over 2. Well, the answer is only in part. Uh, we said that y is equal to y sub c plus y sub p. What tells us that the solution is of this form? What tells us that? Starts with the S. Superposition approach, uh, the superposition principle, excuse me. Yes. Right. It's a lot of syllables in that, right? It's, it's rough old country boy, man. <laughs> So here, y is equal to c sub 1 times e to the, what was that, 2x or negative 2x? Negative 2x, OK. Negative 2x plus c sub 2 times x times e to the negative 2x, and then plus the uh, y sub p, which is plus x squared minus 4x plus 7 over 2.
Let's see. Let's look at number 13. This will be the last problem that I'll work uh, today and then um, I'll talk about the, uh, the test for Wednesday. Okay. So the first part is solve y double prime plus 4y equal to 0. This implies the auxiliary equation is m squared plus 4 equal to 0. And here we get m is equal to plus or minus 2i. So if you think about that, <coughs> you know, it's supposed to be able to form alpha plus or minus beta i. So alpha is 0 and beta is 2. So we, we have the solution part uh, that is complex. So y sub c is equal to c sub 1 times cosine 2x plus c sub 2 times sine of 2x. If you make a connection between your, your calculus 2 and, and this class, and even with physics, this form of y double prime plus 4y is said to be harmonic motion. And we have a section here in this class that we we kind of uh, dig into that in detail. So, part two, consider g of x. g of x is equal to 3 sine 2x. So, we need to assume the form for y sub p. So, assume y sub p. of the form y sub p equal to, what do you say? David, you, you talk like Peter in, in the New Testament, and so I do thank you for your boldness. It's not correct, but <laughs> thank you for your boldness. <laughs> And that's how old Peter was. You know, sometimes he'd be wrong, but he'd still speak up. So y sub p, watch this, is ax cosine 2x plus bx sine 2x. Now, my first question is, why the cosine and the sines? I guess I better sit down for this. <laughs> it feels good. <sighs> Boy. So why the cosines in the sign? I have two questions. I have a question after that, so come on. <laughs> There's two ways you can answer that. You can answer that by looking in the notes in the introduction for this section where it, it talked about, you know, examples of what GX is and how you should write the form for YCP. That's one way to answer it. And then the other way to answer it is just to kind of, you know, use, use that little thing up there on top of our eyes and uh, just think about what's going on. <laughs> and either one, I accept. You can use your mind or you can use the notes. <laughs> Are you all this quiet at the business meetings at church? 
<laughs> you come to our business meetings at church, man, I tell you. You got folks who don't even say amen on Sunday morning, but they say a whole lot at those business meetings. They're concerned about how that money is being spent. Oh, boy. <laughs> If I have this group at the business meeting, I think we can probably get some stuff done over at that little church. But mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, we're gonna be here for a while. <laughs> so why do we have to write the signs and the cosines for the assumption for the form for Y sub P? Hmm? No. Did you see the introduction? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, the graph does have something to do with it. I don't know. The question is, is that the graph for hyperboloid? I didn't work that one out uh, in terms of the graph. Um, I just used some algebra and trig. Um, but but graphically, you are correct uh, if if you can see it. Yes. Yes. And see, when you talk about the solution, you're getting those conjugate, com conjugate complex solutions in the graphs from Y sub C directly, because it already has cosine and sine in it, right? So, um, and then Y sub P has a cosine and sine in it. That's our first question. My second question is why the X applied there? Uh, but to answer the question, why should Y sub P look of the form cosine plus some sine is is very simple. If you if you say y is equal to sine two x, right? Just say that, or three sine two x doesn't matter. Then y prime would be what? A cosine, right? Y double prime would give you back another sine. So bless you. So these solutions in terms of this differential equation, you're going to be bouncing, oscillating on sines and cosines. Even though they give you just one, one guy, this sine 2x, uh, since it's an oscillating graph, uh, you will cross the, uh, uh, the curve or the graph for cosine as well, because you're taking first derivative, second derivative, that kind of thing. So I mean, that, that's one way to answer that, if you think about it. The other way is, if you look in the, uh, the introduction for this section, it lists, didn't it list, like if g of x looks like this, how should you write uh, y sub p? And so one of the considerations is if g of x was equal to 5 cosine 3x, then y sub p should be a cosine uh, 5x plus b sine you know, 5x, but a combination of, of the sort. Okay, good. Why the x here in y sub p? The ax times cosine plus the bx times the sine. Why the x? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. We're getting this duplicate, right? This duplication from in terms of y sub p and y sub c. Y sub c already has cosine 2x, sine 2x, right? And the solutions must be linearly independent. But here they would be linearly dependent if you kept y sub p as a cosine 2x plus b sine 2x. That would be the same thing as, as y sub c, because a could be c sub 1 and b could be c sub 2. So you wouldn't get anything. You just get some mess. So we have to uh, trump it up. Uh, well, no reference to Donald Trump on yesterday, but anybody go to that? I want to go. I had a lady from my church. She left earlier. So 
So she told my wife, tell the pastor I'm going to hear Donald Trump. I thought that was pretty cool. I said, man, I want to, you know, because was Mark Rubio, was he here on, was it Saturday? Yeah, man, that guy was here. And um, they, they've they been talking on the news this morning. That was a pretty big turnout. Uh, who was at the stadium in Madison? Was it Trump at the stadium in Madison? And uh, I don't know where Mark Rubio was. Was he, was he where? Space and Rocket Center. That's just historic stuff, man. Anyway, let's solve this. So, so y is we're saying is equal to this a x cosine two x plus b x sine two x. So y prime. Use the uh, the product rule, so it's just a cosine two x minus two a x sine two x plus b sine two x plus two b x cosine two x. And we need y double prime because the original problem is y double prime plus 4y. So this is negative 2a sine 2x minus 2a sine 2x minus 4a x cosine 2x plus 2b cosine 2x plus 2b cosine 2x minus 4bx sine 2x. Let's get him by itself. And we need to simplify this guy because some of these terms may overlap or may be combined. So let's say y double prime is equal to, let's see what we have here. So that 2b cosine 2x and the 2b cosine 2x can be combined. So let me uh, underline those. See that sine 2x with the constant, and then this sine 2x. So these two guys can go together as well. We we'll add those up. Hmm. Thought that was a different color. And these two are unlike. So. So what we have here is negative 4a sine 2x then minus 4ax cosine 2x plus 4 b cosine 2x minus 4b x sine 2x. So that's what we have for y double prime. So the problem was y double prime plus 4y is equal to 3, I believe it was, yes, 3 sine 2x, 3 sine 2x. So we've got to put all that in for y double prime. So y double prime is that negative 4a sine 2x minus 4ax cosine 2x plus 4b 
cosine 2x minus 4bx sine 2x. So I think that's all for that one. And then plus 4 times y. And y was the ax cosine plus um, the uh, bx sine. So it's just 4 ax cosine 2x plus 4 bx sine 2x and that's all equal to the 3 sine 2x. Let's see if something cancels out or can be combined. All right, so I'm looking for a, a 4ax cosine 2x over here. Well, there it is. It's just the opposite, right? So that cancels out. What about a 4bx sine 2x? 4bx sine 2x is negative. That's positive. It cancels out. It help, helps us out a whole lot. We have left. This term plus that term is equal to the 3 sine 2x. So let's, let's write that. So we have minus 4a sine 2x plus 4b cosine 2x is equal to 3 sine 2x. Right. So do you see here that this implies that negative 4a is equal to 3, and 4b is equal to 0. Do you see that? Hmm? You just connect you know, both sides. If it's equal, so the left side has to equal to the right side. The left side, I have a, a sine 2x. So I set that equal to this sine 2x. So that's negative 4a equal to 3. On the left side, I have a cosine 2x. I do not have a cosine 2x on the right side. So it's 4b equal to 0. And so here, a is equal to negative 3 over 4. And so y is equal to the y sub c plus y sub p. And this was c sub 1 times cosine 2x plus c sub 2 times sine 2x. And then the other part was the ax cosine uh, 2x plus uh, the bx, but b is 0. Uh, sine, so this is just minus 3 over 4 times x cosine 2x. Bless you. And that was number 13. Same problem that I. That's it. Okay. Good. Worked out easier than what I thought. <laughs> the, the one that's in the sample exam, if you ever take to notice that one, um, it's very similar, uh, but the coefficients a and b to solve for the, the, the strange numbers. But still the same process. Any other questions? OK. The, I think the sample exam, and I'll pull it up in just a minute, um, I think is a really good indicator of this test. Uh, what I would do is I list it down for you um, 10 problem um, formats for this test, so it'll be 10 problems and then plus a bonus problem. 
Uh, and so I'll look at, uh, pull up the sample exam online. We'll look at that. I have the solutions out there. They're, they're good. And you can kind of model yourself uh, with those problems. And then I want to just give you a highlight, an overview of, of how the test we broke down, problem one, problem two, problem, and so on to problem 10. Okay. I have to change that from exam, sample exam three to example exam two. Um, and, I, and I thought about it today. I said, why was it exam three? What happened to exam two? Last year, <laughs> um, students, like I told you, just, just, just an, apparently a normal thing. They didn't do so well on test number one. I gave them a take home exam for exam two, which wasn't this exam. Um, there was a, something in between. And then we came back and I gave them exam two, which here is their exam three, but it's the same as your exam number two. Okay. So the, uh, the first problem uh, for the sample exam is to write the, uh, the definition for linearly independence. This is gonna be straightforward. Number two, given a problem, use the Warren scheme um, to determine whether or not these functions are linearly independent. Number three, state the superposition principle for homogeneous uh, differential equations and also the superposition principle for non-homogeneous differential equations. The, the next problem comes from uh, section, uh, bless you, uh, 4.2, uh, where you're given a differential equation, we give you one solution, you find the second solution by the formula. And, uh, and, and I have the formula stated on the test. So just plug that second solution, the first solution into that formula. Make sure you get the right uh, P of X. Notice here for number five, P of X, um, is equal to the negative 7x divided by the x squared. So you can make sure you get the right p of x. Uh, number uh, 6, number 7, and numbers 8 come directly from section 4.3. And I still follow that same, that same flow on the exam. And, and my goal there is, I'm gonna give you three problems from 4.3. Three problems where one problem, you have to solve that DE and you will have uh, distinct roots. One problem, you will have uh, repeated roots. And then a third problem from that section, you would have complex roots. And then the last problem uh, that you will have on the test, mm -hmm. would come from uh, section, we just got to talking about section 4.4, uh, where you have to use the superposition approach to solve for a uh, non-homogeneous differential equation. And so, yeah, that was the problem that I had in mind, and I thought I was working that one. And that guy, uh, you got here, uh, g of x is equal to cosine 2x. Uh, for our problem, I think it was sine 3, sine 2x, something like that. 
with that problem there on the sample exam, it's a whole lot to go through um, for that one. And so we, we just hope that our problem is not so extensive. Well, it won't be. It won't be. I won't give anything that long. Um, yes, sir. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that in just a moment. Yes, sir. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Uh, number 11 as well. Numbers 10 and 11 on the uh, sample exam, they come from section 4.4. Uh, I will give you one of those problems. So let me just list out just quickly and then we'll go um, how this test would look for you uh, when you come back. Test number two. So problem one would consist of definitions. And so here you want to make sure you know the definitions for linearly independent. Linearly dependent superposition principle here for the homogeneous. non-homogeneous number two you want to be able to show whether or not a a group of functions are linearly independent or dependent Show that a given set of functions are linearly independent. Or linearly dependent. You can you can show that either by the warrant scheme, and it'll be your choice in that. Or by determining the coefficients. quick example of that would be something like let's say six comma cosine squared x and sine squared x. If you have something like that, don't use the Warren scheme. I mean you could use it but it's it's way difficult. You'll be there forever trying to Simplify all that because you have to find the first derivative, the second derivative, and then you have to use that big old determinant to try to, you know, uh, simplify that down. Um, I, I gave an example. There were some examples like this in our lecture, so you want to just go back and make sure you have reference to that. Number three would be an application problem from 3.1.
number four as well. Application problem from 3.1. Let me stop there and kind of kind of help you so you can narrow down what problems I'm talking about. I we cover a lot of problems in, in that section. Um, so just to help you out, in 3.1, I'm considering number four. And I shouldn't be telling you this because I'm like just giving you the test, you know. But so I'm expecting y'all to really do well, right? Eesh. <laughs> 13, 17, and 29. And what that simply means is that I, I've cut out some of the other problems there that would take you a little bit long to work, longer to work. So these are kind of straightforward problems. Shouldn't take you as much time. Um, there were some problems that, that I did in class where we used a lot of you know, information from physics. I'm not going to require that on this test. Um, there was one problem, it was like a mixture problem, um, so I'm not going to cover that on this test as well. So this would be just very straightforward um, in terms of um, uh, population growth, population decay. Um, uh, there would be a problem where you have to solve a, 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 a circuit using um, that, that linear differential equation model. So um, it, it'll be very perfect how it fits into that. And so um, the, the goal here is that um, you would have seen this information a few times. Because even for, for the first test information, I talked about it back then, just didn't test you on it. So now I'm going to put it on the test, OK? Um, and then the other problem deals with the Newton's law of cooling. Newton's law of cooling. Again, same problem type from the first test material that I didn't test you on, but I'll test you here, okay? Number five. Number five is going to be a problem from section 4.1. That's the problem where we basically give you the differential equation, we give you the solution, and then we say verify that these are the solutions, right? Uh, verify the superposition approach. So for that problem, you're not solving. You're just taking the, the solution, find the first derivative, second derivative, plug it back into the equation, see if the left side equal to the right side. So I, I worked the problem like that in class for you as well. So it should be a very easy, straightforward, 10-point problem. You ought to be able to get that one, okay? Um, number six is from section 4.2. I give you a solution to one solution, then I asked you to use the formula to find the second solution. That's that problem, number uh, six. Number seven, eight, and nine, they come from section 4.3, and I told you how, how that's going to be. Right? And then number 10 is from section 4.4. Now, the bonus problem would be a problem where, you remember how in some of these uh, things um, I deduced where the formula came from? Right. A proof, yes. So that'll be the bonus. So I, I did that on a few of those. I can't tell you which one. But, uh, but uh, let's go back and, uh, again, whatever I've covered in class, um, uh, you should be able to to do that, and I think you should uh, fare well. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.